So you went on over how many dates do you think? I don't know. I mean, hundreds. But I mean, for a period of time in my 20s anyway, I was going on probably upwards of four dates a week. After like a relationship ended, I was just trying to meet people and get out there. And I found myself going on like three, four dates a week, sometimes two dates in a day, like just going out and meeting people. I would literally go on like have drinks with someone or dinner with someone like that is it. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Do you think that of all of the highs and lows that you went through, would you say that that was worth it? Oh, absolutely. I think I had to go through all of that. I had to go through all those highs and lows to figure out who I was and what I wanted. And and maybe I'm still figuring out why I had to go through that. You can meet the right guy at the wrong time, which is exactly what I did. And I was lucky enough to find him a second time. This is Jen. In 2011, I moved to Los Angeles from Chicago. And Jen was one of the first people I met through a friend. I was in the midst of a breakup from a four and a half year relationship. I had never really dated per se, in the sense of simply going on dates. And I was trying to wrap my head around the online dating phenomenon. So I brought it up to Jen, having heard through the grapevine that she was a participant in the dating scene. And kind of bitterly, she responded, dating in LA sucks. When I said dating in LA sucks, I was online dating like a G6, let me tell you what. And it was a roller coaster. You know, you start talking to someone on like whatever website you're talking to them on and they're kind of cute and so you get excited and then you never hear back from them and you go back down the roller coaster and then now you're talking to someone else and they're kind of cute and they seem awesome and then you meet them and there's something wrong with them and you hate them and then oh you like someone and you meet them and then they don't like you and they never call you back and then you're back down the roller coaster. People were always looking for the next best thing. And some people were just interested in next, 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 always looking to one up who they'd been with before. And it was really hard to make a real connection. And there are a lot of people that aren't honest. Jen is originally from Florida, West Palm, close to Disney, beautiful beaches. She loved everything about her experience growing up, except that dating was nil. I had never really dated. I didn't go to a high school where there were single straight guys. I went to an arts high school, everyone was gay. You went to an arts high school? I went to pretty much fame, but in Florida. There were like four hot single straight guys that were always dating someone, usually one of your good friends. So I didn't learn to date. I went to an arts college where everyone was gay and I didn't learn to date. I didn't know what I wanted in another person. I didn't know how to be myself. I didn't know any of that. So I took that time in my 20s to explore it and I freaking explored it, I think, to the fullest. Can I swear on here? I'm allowed to swear, right? Yeah. All right, good. Jen went to school in Boston at Emerson College. During her time there, she realized she had a special knack for pointing out talent in others. Shortly after, she got involved in casting and wound up running a division of Boston Casting all four years of her college career. Emerson has an internship program in LA. And so at 21, Jen moved to LA to finish her last semester of school and pursue her dream of being a casting director. And needless to say, for someone like Jen, who hadn't dated much before, Moving to L.A. at 21 was a rip-roaring good time. There was something to do every night. There was somewhere to be every night. There was a cute boy to meet. I didn't have classes some days, or some days I didn't have class till the afternoon, so there were different bars we'd go to. Oh, Monday is comedy night here. Wednesday is karaoke night at this bar. And I had a bunch of Emerson people that all moved out here at the same time, and it was busy. In my career as a casting director, which I was a casting director for 12 years, I got to read opposite a level and caliber of talent I never would have gotten to work with if I were a a struggling actor in Los Angeles. I mean, actors from my childhood that I loved in the 80s, people that like were huge. Joey Lawrence. I mean, I was in love with him when I was nine. Being in casting, there are a lot of mixers for casting assistants and casting associates. And you get together with agents and managers and their assistants. So tons of young assistants getting together for drinks several times a week. And it would you'd go out with the same people every weekend. You know, Friday and Saturday night, you'd be out with the same group. And then there started to be like a Wednesday night group. So I was spending three nights a week with the same group. You would work all day and then go out till one in the morning, get up at eight and be back at work. And I ran myself ragged. I surely did. I did not take care of myself very well in that time. But I learned how to in that time. That's how I learned how. I was on 
plenty of fish. I tried J-Date. I tried a little bit of Match. I tried a little bit of eHarmony. The ones that you paid for weren't great. OkCupid was my mainstay for many a year. I think I pretty much hated every guy on OkCupid at least one date. The problem with all those pay sites is even if you see someone interesting on there, nine times out of 10, they don't have a paid account. So you can message them all you want, but they'll never see it and they'll never reply to you because they don't have a paid account. So sometimes I would stalk people. I was really great at this. And I'd look, I'd look up their username and like Google their username because people aren't creative and they use the same username on every account. So like, you know, Bob Smith 99 on J-Day is probably Bob Smith 99 on OkCupid. Yeah, did you research everybody? Oh, I researched everybody. I am a pro. You give me someone's first name and the city they live in and I can tell you everything about them. I really read profiles. Like I really read stuff and looked at it because sometimes you, someone would look normal and then you'd read their profile and you get to the bottom and like, P.S. I like to dress in women's clothing five nights a week. And I'm like, well, that's great for you, but not what I would like. Thank you. Or like, I'm really into heavy s and oh, Great. Again, great for you. Not for me. What do you do? Do you have a car? Do you have a career? Like these things that sound vain, but they're not vain. It tells me who you are as a, as a person. And are we a match like will our lives mesh in any real way because i'm not looking for a hookup i'm looking for someone i can connect with so when i was looking at people i was really selective and i would talk to people for a long time before i made plans with them send long emails back and forth and kind of get to feel like i was getting to know their personality and then you're always surprised when you meet someone and sometimes not in a good way you know, you can instantly see why someone is single when you sit down with them. It's like, oh, all right, I see. You're that kind of guy who's not impressed with anything. Got it. Or you don't know that you're gay yet. Got it. Okay, cool. Like, figure it out, but not with me. I already dated a gay guy. <laughs> you know? Did you? <laughs> I did. My high school boyfriend is married to a man. Mike and Mike. Being a casting director dating in LA added a whole nother level of difficulty because I couldn't date actors. You know, how do I trust that this person is interested in me and not just what I can do for them? How do I trust what this person's intentions are with me? You never knew if, or maybe it was the guys that I dated, but sometimes a guy would walk out of my door and I'd have no idea if I was ever gonna see him or hear from him again. And it was heartbreaking. People tell you who they are right away. I dated a guy, first night we met, one of the first things he said to me was, I'm an asshole, you don't wanna go out with me. And you know what? He was right. People tell you, sometimes literally tell you who they are the moment you meet them. It's just whether or not you want to listen. And girls sometimes, at least this girl, doesn't. They hear, oh, not with me. He doesn't want a relationship, he said. Oh, he doesn't mean that about me. He means that about before me he didn't want one, and now he does. So people just don't listen. Your intuition is always right. Always. And as women, we really need to know that. The worst dates I've been on are the ones that were like, I think I know I'm not interested the second I walk in and the guy is interested in me because that's really hard. I'm not good at rejecting people. I'm not good at that. I want to like everybody and I want to give everybody a chance because you never know. People might surprise you, but sometimes you just know. There's a guy I started talking to online and for the life of me, I'm like, I feel like I went out with this guy nine years ago like I feel like I met this guy on a different website years ago and and I was honest with him I'm like god I, I gotta tell you I gotta be honest like you look so familiar were you ever on this other dating site he's like yeah I was I'm like ah did you ever have a photo up of, of, of this he's like I think I may have I'm like I don't know if we went out or not dude I gotta tell you and he's like well let's go out again I'm like all right and it was so awkward from the second we sat down I like nerds I'm a nerdy girl but this was like nebbishy awkward date one of the worst dates I've ever been on was this guy who was from Israel. Really cute dude, blonde curly hair. And he just could not get it through his head that I did not want to make out with him in the bar. Putting his arm around me, grabbing my butt as we're sitting there, walked me to my car, shoved his tongue down my throat. I went to the bathroom one point in the night and the girl was like, oh, how long have you and your boyfriend been together? I'm like, he's now my boyfriend and I cannot get this man off of me. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I dated a guy who was getting married the following weekend after our date. Okay, here's my worst date ever. I was in my mid-20s, and I was talking to this attractive guy. I met him online, and he's like, oh, we should go to the shooting range downtown. I'm like, yeah, that sounds, I've never done that. That sounds really cool. We go to the shooting range, and it was interesting, and he kept wanting to shoot, like, bigger and more interesting guns, and, like, so when the end of the day comes, and they give him a check, he wants to split it with me. 
I paid like 80 bucks to help him shoot guns that I didn't even shoot. So we walked in my car, he tries to kiss me, and I'm like, oh, I don't know, I've got a vibe. I'll go out with you again, I'll give you another chance, but I'm not going to kiss you right now. So I go home, and I'm literally leaving to go out of town, like, the next day. And he wants to see me that weekend. He's like, Adam, it has to see me that weekend. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm going to Hawaii. Like, I can't, I'm, not, I'm literally not in town. So it's something sets me off. Something triggers a little question in my head. And again, women, when you have that little ding go off, it's always right. Always. So I do some Googling, and I find him, and I find a wedding registry. And I find his fiance's page and then I find his Facebook page it was hidden under like some other stuff and people are like congratulations man have a great have a great wedding this weekend got married that weekend no lie got married that weekend can you tell me about some good dates that you went on where you you really thought things were going somewhere and then they didn't go anywhere Mm -hmm. there's a guy I went out with who I was like, oh my God, this guy is so my type. He was like nerdy and adorable and he had a great career. And I just, oh, I liked him so much. We went on a second date and that seemed to go really well. And then I just never heard from him again. You know, it was heartbreaking at the time. But you never know what's going on with someone else. He could have met someone else. He could have gotten back together with someone. He could have, he could have just not liked me. Who knows? It was a big bummer. There was even a guy that I dated for about a year. First date, I was like, oh my God, he was like the cutest boy ever. And every time he walked out my door, I had no idea if I was ever gonna see him again. He was the biggest mess ever as far as his life went, but I had high hopes. I didn't want to let it go. I wanted it to be what I wanted. I wanted him to be my guy. And it was so wrong from the beginning. And I knew it was wrong. And I knew that it wasn't going to really ever go anywhere. But you hope. And the story of my real romantic life is this. I was always the friend. I was always in love with someone who I couldn't have. And had to put my feelings on the back burner. I wanted more than anyone was ever willing to give me. They didn't want me to be their girlfriend. And I always wound up getting hurt. I always wound up kind of feeling like, okay, what I want isn't important. What I want is less important than my friendship with this person or what I want is less important than just having this person around. I felt so confused and unattractive and unappealing and unwanted a lot of the time in my 20s because I was just so stupid and didn't (laughs) didn't know my worth so I accepted less than what I truly wanted if I'd been honest with any of them because I knew the second if I was honest with them they would have run out the door and I wanted it to last a little longer like what is something that you would be honest about I wanted a relationship none of it was right none of those relationships would have been the right ones I knew every time I went through a heartbreak every time something didn't work out the way I wanted it to every time I was disappointed or stood up or bailed on or ditched or dropped or Anytime I didn't like someone that I thought I was going to like or someone didn't live up to my expectations, I was like, the right guy won't give me that. I wanted that feeling. I wanted the feeling in my head of what it would be like when I was with someone who loved me. And I had never really experienced that in my life, but I knew what it would be like. And I was right. Here's why I was bad at dating, and I'll loop all this together. I was bad at dating because I'm impatient. I don't like the rules of, you're a woman, you can't call him. I don't like sitting and waiting for what I want. I go after what I want in my life in all areas. So in dating, I didn't understand how to turn that off. And I'm sure I scared off a whole shit ton of guys. But that was fine. If they don't like that I'm going to be the one to call them or text them and say, I had a great time. I'm not being a crazy girl. I'm just being like, hey, you're awesome. I had a great time. Would love to see you again. Thanks for dinner. And if they can't handle that, then they're not for me. I got to a point where I'm like, okay, the right guy won't even make me wait. When I'm with the right guy, I won't have to wonder, am I going to hear from him? Should I text him first? It's been two and a half days and 14 hours, but I don't know. I might hear from him. He said he was going to call me next week and it's Friday, but maybe he meant set. The mind games that you play in your own head 
almost every woman I know does it. And beyond that, the right guy for me won't make me do that. He'll be calling me before I have a second to even think about if I'm gonna hear from him. He'll be calling me before I even think about should I text him first? And that's exactly what Brian did. Like, didn't give me a second to wonder. Made his intentions known. And when Brian and I got together, it was everything they say it'll be when a guy is into you. Everything. I had plans with a, an old friend of mine. And she calls me up and she says, is it, is it cool if my friend Brian comes? We had plans or he wanted to hang out. And I said, maybe he can come along. He'll drive. And I'm kind of brash. So in my head, I said, oh, I wonder if he's cute. No, don't say it. Don't say it out loud. Don't jinx it. So I was just like, all right, yeah, sure. Why not? And then they come to my apartment to pick me up and they walk in my house and my inner monologue goes, he is cute. So I thought he was adorable and of course I made the first move and got his number and we dated for about a minute and a half. Went to a movie and dinner where we got into an argument about Indiana Jones because the new Indiana Jones movie had come out and I didn't hate it. I know, I know, I know. Everyone the hated it. The fourth one? Yeah, I know. Shut up. I had just seen it and there was something about it that I wanted to fight for, that I wanted to love Indy no matter what it was. And at one point where he and I were talking about it kind of heatedly, I was like, wait, wait, are we arguing right now? Like, I, I was this an argument? I thought we were just talking about it. I, we, we didn't see each other again after that. I was fortunate enough that while I was doing this interview with Jen, Brian came home and was able to weigh in on the discussion. And to be clear, it wasn't just Indiana Jones they had argued over. It was also Ghostbusters. Jen had felt Ghostbusters 2 was the better Ghostbusters. And in Brian's words, it galled him. Now to get an idea of the context of both of their lives at this point, Brian's career, he's a television writer, was just blooming. He had just gotten off a show called Kyle XY and had gotten hired as a script coordinator on One Tree Hill. He was also starring in his own play, Here's Brian. I started working at One Tree Hill as a script coordinator before the play started, so I was also starting a new job at that point. So I was really, you know, I had a lot going on, but also was kind of transitioning in, you know, in my worldview. Like, I was very convinced that, like, I was a big shot and what I was doing was, like, super cool. And I decided to do something big, which I'm really proud of. So the question is, like, why did I not chase it down? Because I was, like, charmed by her immediately when I met her. And, I mean, Jen might say I still am capable of being kind of, like, a dickhead about things. Like, the fact that she really thought that Ghostbusters 2 was, you know, the better Ghostbusters movie, it just was, like, unacceptable to me, you know? And the Indiana Jones... (laughs) in absolutely just me being like callow and young and kind of not getting that this is somebody who could really see me. There was something else that was bothering Brian. Jen had a hamster. Yeah, well, uh, so this hamster that she had in her place, you know, which I got it immediately. It's like, wow, this is a woman who's in charge of her own, you know, she's making like her own way. She's got her place, you know, not only does she have her own place, she's got a hamster. And now I needed to figure out what I think about this hamster. She just told me the other night that some dark individual, like, made it a secret Santa gift. So everybody immediately was like, you know, hot hot potato on the, you know, taking care of another life. But Jen lapped in and took care of this thing for years. Of course, Brian couldn't see any of this at the time. And Jen, conversely, was preoccupied with her own life-changing events. I just gotten out of a big relationship. We had had this off and on anti non pseudo relationship for three years. And when it ended, I went into a huge spiral. My heart like physically hurt. And I dove into studying Buddhism. I dove into meditation. So I was really at the beginning of a lot of very intense self-discovery. And I wasn't ready for Brian then. Six years passed. And in that six years, Jen went on to get her MBA in entertainment. She switched careers. She got her own big apartment and she adopted a dog named Bailey. I had figured out what I wanted and what I didn't want and knew what I would accept and what I didn't accept. I was just waiting for the right guy to come along and see it. When I got the dog, it was like, here's the love. Here's somewhere for me to channel my love. Here's a place for me to be, to say, I am so thankful for the love that I have. I may not have the love that I know is coming someday and the love that a part of me wants really badly, but 
focus on the love that I have. Look at this love this little creature is giving me and that I am able to give to him. Brian, in turn, began living out his dream as a full-time writer. And in the course of life transitions, there is always the sweeping away of the old in order to make room for the new. And in Jen's case, she swept her Facebook. And Brian's name happened to get caught up in the debris. <laughs> she mentioned to you about the Facebook thing, and I noticed that she defriended me. You know, it kind of woke me up a little bit. So I kind of thought about her, and there was some spark that I guess like was really always in there, and you know was triggered by her being like, "All right, no mas." I get a message on OK Cupid saying, "Hey, have you been? It's Brian. Like, hope you're well. I was gonna invite you to my birthday party this weekend, but realized that you had deleted me from your Facebook. No hard feelings." And I was like, "That's interesting," because I had recently gone out with a guy that reminded me of him, but he was less cute. I'm like, oh, here he is. He's single. He's messaging me. I've changed a lot in the last six years. Maybe he has too. I'm like, if this guy wants to see me, he can take me out. So he did. He took me out and he shocked me and he swept me off my feet. Especially because before when he and I went out, one of the issues was I'm like, are we dating or are we just hanging out? Like he wouldn't pay sometimes. Sometimes he would pay. And I don't care about money. I was just trying to gauge if this was a date or not. And like sometimes he'd give me a little kiss and sometimes he wouldn't. And I'm like, ah, I don't want this amb- this ambiguous thing again. I'm too old now. Like I've been through all those years of the other stuff we talked about. I'm not going to do that. Well, he messages me the day before our plans and says, we're going on a date tomorrow. The record kind of skipped in my brain. I'm like, well, this is already different than who I knew you to be six years ago. Wow. Okay. And he was just as cute as I remembered him being. He was charming. He seemed like he had his shit together, which in this town is exceedingly rare. Everyone that you meet like has just moved here, fresh off the boat, working on themselves, doesn't know who they are, what they want. And here's this cute guy who has a good career and like took me out to a nice dinner and didn't try to split the check. Which again, not about money. It's how a woman is treated. It's how you act on a date. So it was really a great first, second, second first date. So after we got back together, our second date, we spent the whole weekend together. And I kept waiting for him to kind of get sick of me or tell me he had somewhere to be or tell me he had something to do. And it didn't happen. He just kept wanting to be around me and then started calling me. Within a few months, he was inviting me home to meet his family. For every time he called, he's like, oh, he's going to cancel this trip. He's going to cancel it today. No, he's going to cancel it. Never canceled it. We went and met his whole family, and they were awesome. We moved in together in December of last year, and I couldn't believe it was happening. It felt so surreal. I read so many books about being single, too. It's like, you know, make room for love. Like, look at your life. Or do you sleep in the middle of your bed? Because if so, you're putting out a signal to the universe that you don't have room for someone in your life. And if you're looking constantly for love, then all you're putting out is that you're lacking something. And when you're putting out into the universe that you're lacking something, all the universe is going to do is give you more of this hole to fill. So I started like sleeping on one side of the bed. I started trying to live my life in a way that would really have room and breath for someone else. For a belated birthday gift, Jen took Brian to Catalina Island. One night, they were out for drinks, and as my sister says, they began to feel fuzzy. And as they were feeling fuzzy, they began to talk about marriage. I don't even know how it first came up, but I was like, just FYI, if you're looking at rings, I know what I want. I want cushion cut, and I want, I am such an asshole, and I totally ruined it. The next day, feeling mortified, Jen vowed to not bring up the topic of rings or marriage again. And a week later, Brian and Jen find themselves house-sitting for a friend. He's in the kitchen and he shouts over, so why don't you show me some of those rings you were talking about? So we sit down and we start showing him these photos of rings I liked, whatever, and he says, well, you should make an appointment and go look at them. And I didn't make an appointment. I let it go for like three weeks. So a couple of weeks go by and he brought it up again. And I'm like, no, I didn't make an appointment yet, but I will. And then I think to myself, I'm not going to make an appointment yet. (laughs) I'm going to let him say it one more time. Brian brings it up a third time. This time, Jen concedes, makes an appointment, and they go to a jeweler's downtown. They find rings that are pretty, but don't really scream the one. So they decide to give it a rest 
and they head to Michigan, where Brian's parents live. And Brian, Jen, and Brian's mother go out vintage shopping in search of the ring. His mother is phenomenal. I won the mother-in-law lottery. Still, with no luck, Brian and Jen return to Los Angeles. About a month goes by. Then, one day, at a jeweler's in Beverly Hills. So when you try on engagement rings, it's a really interesting process. Like, especially at this store, they bring you like a tray of rings at a time and you try them all on and anything you like, you put over in a little bucket next to you. And then once you get through looking at everything, they bring the little bucket of favorites back, you know, and you try all those on and then narrow them down and compare them. And then I got down to two rings. Well, then when you're down to two rings, they bring over a wedding band. And I put a wedding band on with this ring and I just like, <gasps> you know, I clasped my mouth and I got all of a sudden like got hot and emotional and cry- weepy like a total girl. And he's like, is this one you want? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, like am, I, am I making a decibel that only a dog can hear right now? With the ring safely concealed, they go back to their normal lives. So I'm thinking it's going to be like six months. Well, nine days go by. (laughs) It was a Friday. Jen had a work event that she totally forgot about. And usually when she has work events, she tends to get out early. So she texted Brian that she was coming home early. And on the other end of that text was a man frantically decorating, blowing up balloons, setting out champagne, getting dressed up. Well, I walk in and like jeans and a t-shirt from this work event, and I see this gigantic bouquet of balloons, and then I see a giant arch across our sliding glass doors in our living room that's spelling out, I love you, Jenny. And I'm just like, <gasps> like I was as shocked as if, we, if I didn't know we had a ring. And before I know it, he's like, put your stuff down. Come here. And I'm like, okay. And he proposed to me right there on the floor. Got down on one knee and said, you know, we've got a reservation for dinner at this place. Go get changed. And it was magnificent. The whole night kept being like, I proposed to this young lady tonight. And this lady agreed to marry me tonight. I felt for so many years in my dating life that even guys I was kind of going out with were ashamed of me or like just didn't want to be with me. And here's this guy who not only loves me, for who I am, completely, but is proud to be with me. One of the biggest things that changed for me when he and I got together is that I went out with a girlfriend for drinks, and I found myself having drinks with my girlfriend instead of periphery having drinks with my girlfriend, but really looking around the room. Who's that? Is he straight? Is he single? Is he with? No, he's with that girl. Okay, no, oh, he's with that guy. Okay, no, he's straight. No, he's gay. Okay, no, he's he's got a ring on. Okay, no, okay. Oh, who's that other guy? Is he cute? No, he's not that cute. Okay, what's he wearing? No, I don't like. The busy brain of a single woman at a bar <laughs> shut off. I had a very abusive childhood in a lot of different ways. Mm. So I didn't learn self value. I didn't learn that I mattered. I didn't learn that men could be good. Um, And I had trust struggle with my weight a lot. That was a big part of my issues I had. You know, I always figured, oh, there's some other thinner girl out there that someone, a guy will like more. Or I'm single because I am 30 pounds overweight. And when I met Brian for the second time around and got together with him, I was at one of the highest weights I've been at in my adult life. Recently, since we got engaged, I've actually lost 50 pounds. Not because I'm trying to lose weight for my wedding. It's because I want to be healthy. And it's because his love gave me the power to lose weight for the right reasons. I'm so stubborn and I'm such a hard ass that even though I thought in the back of my head years ago, I'm single because I'm 30 pounds overweight, I also thought, but fuck them if they don't want me. The right guy is going to love me for who I am. I'm not losing weight for anybody. If a guy wants me, he wants me for me. And I always thought the right guy would see that, would see through it, would still love me and still think I was beautiful. But he gave me the power to lose the weight for myself. Not for some imaginary guy that might like me if I lost X amount of pounds, but for me. Brian is everything I could have dreamt for in a partner times a thousand. You know, there's there's that old saying, oh, I know a little bit about a lot of things. You know, the old jazz song. He knows a lot about a lot. And he listens so well 
to everything, not just to me. He listens and absorbs everything. He can listen to a podcast about World War II and then come back and literally tell me everything about it. I know this sounds silly, but he's a good arguer. He makes me sharper. He makes me better in every way. And he's so funny and he's got such a good heart. He's a good man. You know what I mean? He takes care of people he loves. We've got this little jar on our bookcase. He had the idea of let's put mementos in there of things we do throughout a year. And every year we'll have like a time capsule of our year together. I mean, could you just die? (laughs) Could you just? (laughs) I just recently got my dress, which was one of the last things I needed to do for this wedding. My wedding is completely planned and done. But you know what it is, though? It isn't just me. It's this. It's the wedding industry in Southern California. They say to book everything a year out. And so we got engaged, and I'm like, well, I already know what I want. Why don't we just, you know, if we know what we want, let's just book it now. Because then I'm not fighting everyone else in November for next November. I'm a planner. I've been looking at houses for the last five years. I can't afford to buy a house. But I'm really into the market and I research the market. I can't, I need a new car. I'm not going to get it for a couple of years, but I'm looking at cars. We talked about getting engaged. I started really looking at wedding stuff. I mean, I've been looking at wedding stuff for years, even as a single person. I watched Say Yes to the Dress forever and would look at dresses and stuff. But when we started talking about getting engaged, I really looked up like, what, do, what are the things that people say they forget? What are the things people say, oh, I wish I'd spent more money on this or less money on that? You know, what does it really cost? What are, what are the details that go into planning weddings? Let me tell you, there's a lot. And the dress and the invitations were the hardest part. I went to pretty much every dress shop in LA. I started trying on dresses 40 pounds ago and had a really shaming experience at one store, body shaming experience. It was very traumatizing the first weekend I went. Somebody that worked there shamed you? Literally told me, I don't know what to put you in. I mean, come back when you lose weight. This is like nightmare. pretty, pretty woman, like yeah. Rodeo Drive. And that's like, where it was. That's where it was. I don't know if I should say where it was. I can say I don't care, but it was at Saks. Fuck them. But then I got my dress actually at Panache in Beverly Hills, which my chick was awesome. Everyone at Panache has been awesome. Love them, love them, love them. My dress is so not what I thought I wanted. I thought I wanted some like big floofy thing. And every time I tried them on, it just didn't feel right. And the dress that I got, I won't tell you much in case Brian or anyone listens to it, but like, it's just me. I put it on and I cried in it. I love it. Do you think that women should not be texting? It isn't that women shouldn't be doing it. It's that women shouldn't have to. The reason women do it is because they're nervous of if they're going to hear from a guy they like. You go on a date with someone, you really like him, and you're, the moment you, get, you walk in your door home from that date, you're wondering when you're going to see him again. You're wondering when you're going to hear from this guy. You know, a day went by, I went out, I went out with him Saturday, and it's been one, two, three, okay, it's Wednesday, it's been three days, can I text him? I don't know. Am I ever going to hear from him? If I don't text him, what is the harm if I just do it? And I would get to a point where it's like, I could have just texted him already and gotten my answer. And I, and I do recommend that. Because if you're the kind of person like me who would kind of drive yourself nuts, wondering, put yourself out of your misery and just text the damn guy. If he can't deal with you texting him, too bad. But I will tell you, nine times out of ten, if you need to do that, he's not the right guy. Because the right guy won't make you wonder won't give you those three or four days, won't play the game of waiting a week to text you or two weeks or three days or two nights or whatever the new number is that the rule books are telling you about dating that it should be before you text someone. The right guy won't make you wait that. Won't leave you wondering, won't leave you guessing. He won't want to lose you to the next guy that comes along. You are not alone. You are worthy of probably more than you are accepting. And the moment you stop accepting it, the moment you stop responding to midnight texts and going out with guys that you're not even that attracted to because you don't want to be alone, the moment you stop going out with the guy who you think is cute but no, it can't go anywhere, but you really hope that maybe he'll turn his life around since he met you and you're going to change his... Stop. The moment you stop that, you make room for what you really want. Because as long as you're accepting all this other stuff that isn't right, 
you're not, you don't have room in your heart and room in your life for what is right. Let go of all of your self beating up. Be your own best friend. Be your own ally. If you, it's again, another stupid saying that is so true. If you don't love yourself, ain't no one else going to love you. You know, if you don't love and take care of yourself first, you can't expect anyone else to come in and sweep you off your feet and appreciate you if you don't appreciate yourself. And beyond that, it's a numbers game and it's timing. You know, there's a lot of fish in the sea. It's, it's a stupid saying, but it's true. There's a lot of, you know, sad fish and unemployed fish and partially homeless fish and uh, fish who don't know who they are and fish that want to date a whole bunch of other fish. There's a billion different kinds of fish. You only need one. There's a quote that says, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Well, I've made God laugh a whole hell of a lot up there, you know? She's laughing at me all the time. But, <laughs> like, all the, all the plans in the world are really nice. But I believe that for me, anyway, what was destined and what is coming to me has always been better than anything I could have planned, because it has been. The theme of our love and of my life is that if I ever second-guess myself, if I ever question anything, all I have to know is that Brian was brought into my life not once, but twice. We both had to be slapped across the face and been like, yo, this is the person, fucking get it together. Not once, but twice. A few years ago, I took a trip to New York to visit a friend. And that friend told me, dating in New York sucks. I then traveled to Italy for a wedding, and a girl from the small town I was in told me dating there sucked. And it's not just girls, I hear this from guys as well. But why do you guys think this is? Meeting someone should be easy. The apps practically bring suitors to our front door. But why does it still feel foreign and inorganic? Why does it feel exhausting? Maybe I should get more in the mindset of Jen and look at the apps as an opportunity. Or maybe I should just keep living my life and see what happens. I like the second option better. I'd love to hear your stories or thoughts about dating. What's been difficult for you? What you'd like to see change? Why you think people across the world have a hard time with dating? Or why it comes easy to you? You can send me a message on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash mostlyminutia, or you can email me at mostlyminutia at gmail.com or tweet at mostlyminutia. Minutia is M-I-N-U-T-I-A. Thank you to Jen and to Brian for sharing their story. Jen and Brian are getting married this November 12th, which, as it happens, is the same day as the Enchantment Under the Sea dance where George McFly and Lorraine fall in love. Congratulations, Jen and Brian. I hope your wedding is so beautiful. All music today by Chris Zabriskie. Thank you, Chris, for letting me feature your music. You are talented, and I love your minimalist approach. You can find more of Chris's music on bandcamp.com. This episode of Mostly Minutia was recorded on location in Studio City, California. <laughs>